So thank you very much, Javier Becerra, Chairman of the Democratic Caucus, joined by our Vice Chairman, Joe Crowley from New York. Uh, had a, I think, uh, not just a interesting session in caucus today with our members, but uh, one that was very warm and inspiring. We, along with talking about the impl implementation of the Affordable Care Act, of going through the bills that are coming before us this week, we also took a moment to recognize the gentleman who's been in Congress for 21,001 days, uh, over 57 years, the longest serving member in the history of Congress. John Dingell from the state of Michigan has made a lot of people proud. He was here for the passage of Medicare in the 1960s, and he was here for the passage of the historic Affordable Care Act in 2010. Uh, John Dingell is an icon. He has made uh, progress possible for so many Americans, and uh, the list of monumental legislation has become law under uh, John Dingell. We went through that list, and it was just fantastic to see what you can do if you put your heart to it. And so we, we toast John Dingell for being such a stalwart patriot for the American people and for giving such service to the uh, United States of America. Having said that, uh, I wish we could say that the rest of Congress is acting the same. We've now been in session uh, for 60 days. Now, that's different from how many calendar days that we've actually seen elapse this year in 2013. We've seen 161 days elapse in the calendar year so far, but only 60 of those days have we been at work here in Washington, D.C. Yet whether you look at 161 days or 60 days, either way, this House of Representatives has failed to pass one measure dealing with the jobs agenda that the president has so much pursued. And so it's getting not just frustrating for the American people, but for many of us here in Congress who wish to focus on job creation, not on pursuing scandals, not on repeating acts of futility to uh, eliminate the protections and rights that patients now have under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we want to grow the economy. We want to create jobs. And we want to rebuild the middle class. We've already taken 37 votes in this House of Representatives to eliminate the Affordable Care Act, which gave Americans phenomenal rights and protections. Children no longer face discrimination due to a pre-existing condition. Students and young adults in the millions have gained or are keeping their insurance coverage through their parents' plans. Medicare is stronger. Seniors are paying less for prescription drugs and getting better treatment at a lower cost. And now, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, Americans no longer face lifetime time limits on their coverage. So if they get ill and it's a serious illness that lasts a while, they won't lose their insurance coverage as they used to. And put on top of that the fact that millions of, uh, actually billions of dollars have been returned by the insurance companies to Americans in rebates because those Americans were overcharged under the new law when it came to their health insurance premiums. Yet, Today, Republicans in the House Judiciary Committee, rather than vote to improve on the Affordable Care Act or vote on a jobs agenda, they will vote, the Republicans, the 29 of them, all men, on a bill that would restrict a woman's health care choices. That bill we expect to come out to the floor next week. So despite our Republican colleagues' uh, foot dragging, it's interesting to note that the economy has still created 6.9 million private sector jobs in the past 39 months. Nearly 1 million private sector jobs this year alone. That's twice as much uh, in terms of job creation than we saw at the same time during the last recovery in the early 2000s. And while we've seen this consistent job growth, can you imagine what it would be like if we had a Congress that was working with the President on a jobs agenda? Uh, we could be adding far more jobs far more jobs that put Americans in the construction industry back to work, far more jobs that put Americans in the manufacturing, manufacturing industry back to work. We think that that's the agenda that has to be in front of the American people and this Congress, a jobs agenda. So instead of having 37 votes to eliminate patient rights and protections, how about we have 37 votes on a jobs agenda here in Congress? 
And with that, let me yield now to my colleague, uh, Joe Crowley. Thank you, Javier. Uh, firstly, let me join Javier in congratulating uh, John Dingell on a remarkable achievement, being the longest serving member of Congress, either the House of Representatives or Senate, in the history of the United States. I like to uh, refer to John having been elected, uh, as historians would say, in A.D. 1955, and as I like to say, in B.J.C. 7. The year B.J.C. 7 is seven years before Joe Crowley. Uh, I was born in 1962 and was not alive when, when John was first elected to the House, and it's remarkable. He is our tangible link for all the members of Congress to history. Uh, he was in the room when uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared war on Japan. He was acting uh, then as a page. Uh, and uh, the link to his father and the historic nature of his father's career, all the, the bills and, and laws that he saw enacted, as Javier Becerra has mentioned. Um, and it's just remarkable to, to work uh, uh, you know, with this gentleman, with this, this man who's, who has seen so much history and is able to share such wisdom with all of us. And we will look forward to many, many years to come. I also want to uh, join Javier in his pointing out what the real scandal of Washington is. The real scandal of Washington is that this is, going, is quickly becoming the most unproductive Congress in the history of the United States. That is scandalous. Let's have a couple of hearings on that scandal. Maybe bring the leadership of the House in and ask them questions as to why this House has been so unproductive. Let's get to the root of those questions and ask those tough questions and see if they have a response to it. A response to it. Because that's what the American people want to know. They want to know after 160 days of this year and 60 days of us being in session, why we haven't had one single jobs bill pass in the House of Representatives. Not a single jobs bill pass in the House of Representatives. They use the crutch of scandals to divert attention from the issues that really the American people care about, and that is getting Americans back to work. I'd like to see half the effort they've put into the scandals, or a quarter of the effort they've put into the so-called scandals, into finding ways to lower the cost of loans for our students in college today and for students to come. I want to see what they can do to help more Americans afford health insurance. I want to see what they can do to help move this country forward and give a vision to the American people. They have absolutely no vision for progress to help this country move forward, and therefore they fall back on the crutch. That is the true scandal of this, co of this Congress. The scandal is the lack of productivity of this U.S. House of Representatives. Questions? Mike. Yeah, uh, the NSA briefing yesterday evening, uh, there were a lot of members of your caucus who had uh, said they had concerns with those programs. Um, this is going back a number of years, but, but the fact that these programs still exist uh, renewed those concerns number of them leaving this, the briefing yesterday said that, uh, that they still had it, that they weren't alleviated by what they heard at the, at the meeting. I wonder if you're hearing any of those beefs in the caucus this morning and, uh, and how you reacted to the briefing. We have members who want to get to the bottom of this and get as much information about the activities of the government as possible. Uh, but I will certainly say that uh, the first and foremost concern of any member of Congress, whether in our caucus or I suspect in the Republican conference, is to make sure that we are providing security. Uh, we want to do everything we can to make sure that any threat, any attempt to harm Americans uh, is thwarted. And we want to be able to persecute, prosecute uh, those who would do us harm to the full ex extent of the law. And uh, that's why we train our soldiers. That's why we have the best prosecution system in the world, uh, because we want to make sure that people know that our first and foremost priority as members of Congress is to protect the American homeland and the American people. At the same time, as I've said before, uh, we cherish our rights. And perhaps there's no right that's more important than our liberty. And so uh, I think all of us recognize that we have to figure out the happy medium between security and liberty. Uh, I think most members are just intent on getting to the bottom of how we're doing this because we are the representatives for the 310 million Americans who don't have the classified briefings. And so we want to make sure that we understand what's being done. 
Uh, we don't, I don't think there's a, a member in Congress who would say we want to stop the intelligence gathering that is necessary, but we want to make sure that the net that's cast to gather this data, to investigate private information, is done in a way that doesn't undermine what for over 200 years we've grown to love as our liberty and our freedom. And so uh, I think it's absolutely appropriate for us to probe. We're the right people to do that. We have an oversight responsibility under the Constitution to probe and to make sure that the executive branch does not exceed its powers that, that have been granted to it by the Congress or the Constitution. And so I hope that what we will find uh, emanating from this uh, issue that's now in front of us on NSA uh, intelligence gathering and data mining is that we will probe very deeply in Congress to make sure that we're doing the people's job of overseeing the executive branch in trying to provide us with security. Uh, let me yield to the Vice Chairman. I, I would just uh, suggest that what we need to do is, is to strike a balance. Uh, having lived through 9-11 as we all did, but I'm from New York City, uh, I know that certain changes had to be made in order to meet the new challenges that we are, are facing. But we do need to strike that balance between uh, providing for our national security as well as providing for the protection of the rights that we hold so dearly. Uh, what I, I will say, I don't think the solution uh, to those concerns should, uh, should not uh, be massive leaks. Uh, I don't think that's the way in which this should go about. I think that in some cases can uh, put people's lives at risk as well as our national security. And uh, as Javier said, though, that we, we, I think our colleagues still, still are learning more about this. I want to learn more about this as well. Actually, before, can I just say, because uh, I don't know a better way to say it, um, security comes at a price. I think we all recognize that. But liberty is priceless. And so if someone can give a better answer than that, I'm, I'm willing to hear it. But I know I'm going to have to pay a price to make sure I have the security that I need, my family needs, and the American people need. But to me, liberty is priceless. I can't put a price on liberty. And so that's the dilemma we all face, not just members of Congress, but we all face as Americans trying to deal with the realities of the new world and terrorism and threats and the fact that there are a lot of folks who want to do us some harm. I'm sorry, go ahead. There's a disagreement in the Senate about the immigration bill and whether um, a 70 vote sort of threshold would be better to get passed in the House versus a 60 um, just to get passed a filibuster. Do you think that a larger margin pushing for something like 70 would make the bill more successful in the House? And um, the disagreement is that some of that might come at um, increasing some border security measures. Do you think that that would be a problem that could potentially lose Democrats or make it harder for your caucus? Well, it was gratifying to see uh, yesterday's vote in the Senate uh, to put the immigration bill before all the senators for a vote, a debate and vote, uh, 82 to 15. That's bipartisan. That's overwhelming. And I believe it's a good sign that the Senate is intent on trying to fix a broken immigration system, system so that our American families have more sense and security about who's in the country and who's working in America. Our businesses and our economy can unleash their potential because they have certainty about how to go about uh, hiring folks in the workplace. And I think for all those uh, immigrant families that are out there living in the shadows, it's going to give them a chance to prove that they really want to become Americans and go through a process which will be rigorous, but give them a chance to uh, show that they'll become taxpaying American citizens. Um, you know, the, the reality is you need 51 votes to pass legislation in the, in the Senate. These days it takes 60 because of the pr procedural shenanigans that the Republicans have played in the past in thwar thwarting good legislation from making it to the president without the 60-vote threshold. 82 was a good sign. 82 votes was a good sign. Uh, how many votes do they need to pass the bill out? They need 51 votes. Because of the procedural shenanigans, they, made, they need 60. And anything above 51 or 60 sure sends a clear signal not just to the American people but to the House of Representatives that we got some work to do as well. And so we certainly want there to be a robust vote. We hope it doesn't come at the expense of a workable solution that provides common sense and accountability to our immigration system. Accountability implies not just for the immigrant, but for American employers, for the federal government as it implements the enforcement uh, practices that will keep our country secure. And it means accountability for legislators 
who have a responsibility after their election in November to do what the American people have said we should do, and that is fix a very broken immigration system that keeps our economy from moving forward. So uh, I think that we'll find that the Senate will figure out a way to do the right thing and come up with an accountable and common sense solution to fixing the broken immig immigration system. Final questions? I'll follow up, I'll follow up on the NSA question if I could. You mentioned the oversight role of Congress. Um, I'm just wondering how Congress is expected to fulfill its oversight role and ensure that the administration is striking that balance between protection and privacy, if not everybody in Congress knows that these programs even existed until a week ago. Should it just be the charge of this very select group of leaders and intel committee uh, people who know about this, or should or does Congress have the right as a whole to know that these programs? Well, again, members of Congress who serve on the committees of jurisdiction uh, receive the briefings uh, directly from our intelligence community. Uh, members of Congress also are provided with classified briefings that give them a great deal of the information that's provided to members who serve on these committees of jurisdiction as well. Uh, and certainly members of Congress have the ability to read and uh, listen and talk to uh, sources that provide additional information to complement what we've received directly from our intelligence community. Uh, I would say that members should be pre as prepared as possible to understand what's going on so they can try to explain without revealing any classified information to each and every constituent that's out there what's going on. Uh, but I would say this, that if we don't fulfill our oversight responsibility well here in Congress, then we give license to the executive branch to perhaps cast the net farther and further and deeper than it needs to, and to then perhaps one day use that information in ways that were not intended. And if no one's bird-dogging this, no one will ever know. And, and so perhaps the biggest concern I have is making sure that when we go about doing the business of securing people's safety, our loved ones we know will be protected because of the security work that our intelligence community is doing. I want to make sure that I'm not missing something because I didn't take the time to find out. If I can find it out, I'm doing the best job I can. And the intelligence community should know, and the administration should know, and the White House and any president should know that we're going to bird dog this. We're going to sniff out as much as we can because we have the responsibility to make sure that no one exceeds the powers that they've been granted. Some of us have concerns about the extent of the powers that were granted to the executive branch. But right now we've got a law in place, and we should at least do our responsibility here in Congress to make sure that we're overseeing that the executive and our intelligence community do not overreach when it comes to gathering that intelligence information. That's good. I just want to follow up on Ginger's question on immigration. You know, in the past it used to be people who were objecting to a comprehensive bill were against half the citizenship. Now the code word seems to be border security and triggers. Can you talk about that triggers part of the equation and what is acceptable and not acceptable? Uh, Kitty, that's a, actually a great question because the question underpins what's going on on the whole discussion of immigration reform. I, I think most of the politicians have gotten past this so labeling things, uh, amnesty and, uh, you know, giving up our sovereignty. While there's a new label and there's the talk is of border enforcement and the, and the rest, at least now we're focused on something that's real, and that is making sure that we do the best job we can to make sure that we are at the borders doing everything possible to know who's coming into our country and, as well, who's leaving. And so I don't think there's a problem having a discussion about border enforcement. You could go overboard on anything, and you can be excessive when it comes to enforcement to the degree that you're no longer getting any return for that extra dollar spent on enforcement. And if you're now just being mean versus being tough, I think the line should be that we in Congress have to be tough. You want to come into this country? the standards will be rigorous. You come into this country the wrong way, wrong way, the standards will be rigorous. But I'm not interested in being mean just for the sake of being political. And so there's, I think, where we should draw the line. I hope the Senate and the House, when they get to the point of passing legislation, will recognize that the American public is ready for us to be tough when it comes to border enforcement. I don't know if they want us to be mean. But what about that trigger question about you're not 
not going to go on that path until we are very confident that the border is secure. If you say to me, in order, Javier Becerra, for you to stay in this country, you need to work. You cannot become a public charge and get on welfare. And if you do, that's a trigger and you're deportable. In order for you to stay in this country, you must learn English. And if you don't, you're deportable. Uh, you have to make sure, Javier Becerra, if you want to stay in this country, you're paying taxes. And if you're not, you're deportable. Those types of triggers I can recognize and understand because those are triggers asking me to be responsible, personally responsible, to prove to the American people that I wish to stay in this country. And I've, I've earned a chance, I've worked my way through to become a tax-paying American citizen. If I say to you, do all those things so you won't be deported, and by the way, if by chance some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. doesn't do his or her job at the border, now you're deportable as well, I have problems with that because that immigrant has no way of influencing what that bureaucrat does in trying to fulfill the requirements of the law that we protect the border. And so triggers make a lot of sense so long as they're workable and, as I said, so long as they're not mean. And so that's what I hope we're looking at, and I hope we come up with legislation that truly tries to make our immigration system work, which it hasn't for quite some time. I, I would, you know, Javier is uh, certainly one of the experts on this. He's negotiating the bill here in the House, uh, along with six others at this point, but in total really seven. Uh, and I think as he spoke to the point, uh, the sovereignty of our country is a credible issue. It's a real issue. And so is the integrity of our borders. But maybe more importantly at this point is getting a workable, comprehensive bill passed. Let's prove to the American people that we can get things done again. That's what's lacking here in Congress. We can't seem to get a bill passed of substance. And I would suggest that when Mr. Becerra and his uh, fellow co-writers of this legislation uh, pass this bill of the House and the Senate does its work, it will be a significant step forward and maybe will be the catalyst for us to even move on other issues in the, in the next uh, year and a quarter that we'll have left after this passes. Uh, but I think getting a workable bill, one that recognizes the integrity of our border, the, the sovereignty of our nation, and at the same time deals in a humane way with the people who are living in this country, who are contributing to the fabric of our nation, that that also needs to be recognized and not in a trigger, as Javier says, that they have no control over. That is, that is the bureaucracy of, this, of, our, of our nation, uh, depending on who is in the administration and the emphasis and the monies that are directed towards that the development of, those, of, of, of the E-Verify or other triggers. Final question? As I said before, I don't think massive leaks are helpful. Uh, you know, I, whistleblowers, uh, uh, I think there ought to be challenge, there are channels, and there are channels, I think, that, that, that can be used. But I think at the same time, it can put at risk our national security and lives at risk as well. Uh, so I do think uh, that recognizing the balance, as I said before, between our national security and the protection of our civil liberties is important. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, to, as, as Javi, I think, said at best, is that, uh, you know, liberty is priceless to us. Um, but we also recognize our security is important as well. And I think we have to strike that balance. I'm not sure if um, later on I'm going to want to get back to you and revise my answer here. Because you're asking us to go into territory. I know, James, my... Uh, Communications director is wondering where I'm going to go on this. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> you know, because I, I, it's a serious question. And I, and I think I'm, what you're seeing is what every American is going through right now, and that is trying to figure out how far should we go with regard to delving into people's privacy. Because we know the threats are real. And every one of us, I've got three daughters. I want to know that my government, my nation is doing everything to protect my three daughters. And I will let my government go 
quite a distance to make sure that they protect my three daughters. If they're showing me information proving that, in fact, there's a chance that my daughters may be the subjects of an attack. I think whistleblowers are absolutely essential in a democracy. I mean, Daniel Ginsburg did this country a service. But it's, it's a very gray area. What's a whistleblower and what's someone who has uh, leaked information that could be harmful to some of our American assets who are trying to protect American citizens? I don't know the answer to that, and that's why I'm sort of going with uh, Captain Kirk to no pla a place where no man has gone before. Um, I want to have security, but liberty is priceless, and we need people who will defend liberty. And so I have, I have not yet passed judgment on what we do with folks who have revealed some of this information, because I don't know if they did it as whistleblowers or in an unreasonable way and leaked information that was vitally important to us to keep secret. So come talk to me again, but what I will tell you is this, I'm not ready to pass judgment that uh, our government acted completely within the bounds of the law as we passed it, or that the information that was secured should have been revealed. I'm torn, but I will tell you this, uh, I understand my role to make sure that we gather information for security's sake. But I return to what I said. Liberty is priceless. Thank you very much.